Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is going to be the words of the introit, which we spoke together just a few moments ago. But I want to read them to you now in their context. They were drawn for our introit from Exodus chapter 15. And I want to read you now uh, the verses leading up to um, that portion that we read together just moments ago. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. So far, our text. Over the last few years, I have had the opportunity to watch or re-watch in some cases a number of Disney movies. Having children who are just kind of right at that age to kind of be in to those movies and with the advent of Disney Plus, which literally puts the entire catalog of everything that Disney has ever made right there at your fingertips so you can watch it whenever you want. There have been plenty of opportunities to sit down with the kids and to watch, or like I said, re-watch some of these Disney movies. As I've done that, however, I've been reminded on more than a few occasions that these movies, these Disney movies, as beloved as they are, even for myself, are not really an accurate reflection of real life. Real life, the real everyday life that people like you and me live each and every day, is not like a Disney movie. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways in which real life is not like a Disney movie, and you don't necessarily need me to spell them all out for you here today. I'm sure you could figure it all out on your own. But I want to mention just a few things here in particular. First of all, there are, of course, far fewer talking animals in real life. In Disney movies, there's talking animals all over the place. Talking mice, talking dogs, talking cats, talking birds, talking elephants, and the list could go on and on. Animals that talk. In real life, however, the animals that we meet tend to have much less to say, at least not some the words that we can understand. Secondly, in real life, we also learn, often the hard way, that our dreams, even if we do wish them upon a star, don't always come true. In fact, we could probably say that our dreams, the things that we long for the most, rarely come true. Thirdly, unlike Disney movies, in real life, the good guys don't always win. When watching these Disney movies with the kids and you get to kind of that scary part that comes about three quarters of the way to the end of the movie, because they're all kind of follow the same script, when you get to that scary part three quarters of the way towards the end, you can comfort the kids by saying, it's okay, the good guys are going to win, because they always do. But that's not how it works in real life, is it? Human history shows us something different. The good guys don't always win. And finally, of course, real life is not like a Disney movie because people don't, generally speaking, just spontaneously burst into song. It just doesn't happen. 
That kind of thing happens a lot in Disney movies. Characters will be walking down the street, minding his or her own business, and all of a sudden, they'll start singing. And not only that, but an entire crowd, maybe even the po entire population of some village, will just join right in with them and start singing along. And it turns into a chorus. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but that kind of thing doesn't really happen in real life. Not often, anyways, because our text today from Exodus chapter 15 is an exception. In our sermon today, sermon text today, in Exodus chapter 15, Moses and the people of Israel, they do, in fact, burst spontaneously into song, kind of like happens in a Disney movie. Throughout the season of Lent here at Redeemer, we've been working our way through the beginning part of the book of Exodus, the story of how God saved the people of Israel from slavery and bondage in Egypt, how he set them free, and how he promised to take them to this new promised land. And a couple of days ago, on Good Friday, we reached what I guess you could call the climax of that story of God saving the people of Israel. As we read the story of God parting the Red Sea and allowing the people of Israel to walk through the sea, to pass through the sea on dry ground. And we imagined in the sermon that day on Good Friday, the stillness that there must have been. The stillness that the people of Israel must have felt after they passed through the sea, stood there on the far shore of the Red Sea, turned around and saw that that Egyptian army which had been pursuing them had in fact been washed away. We imagined on Good Friday how they must have just stood there still on the seashore in awe of what God had just done. But what we find out today in Exodus chapter 15 is that if there was stillness in that moment, which I bet there was, it didn't last very long. Because Moses, as soon as he's seen what God has done, he begins singing. He begins singing about how God has saved his people. He says, I will sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. And Moses doesn't just sing these words himself. The whole people of Israel join in singing with him. I will sing unto the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. His ho the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The people of Israel were free. They had been rescued. The bad guys had been defeated. And in response to all that God had done in response to the victory that God had won for them, they sang. They sang and they sang and they sang, and I would be willing to bet they didn't sing quietly. They weren't just humming away there in the back pew. They burst into song. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. I don't know about you, but I kind of wish that I could have been there. I kind of wish that I could have been there on the shores of the Red Sea and joined in with them in that song. I wish that I could have added my voice to that chorus as they sang that day. But here's the thing. Even though we weren't there, even though these amazing events, as God saved his people, even though they took place thousands of years ago, we can still join in that song. In fact, in a certain sense, you could even say that we already have. I'm going to read to you now another section of Scripture, this time from Revelation chapter 15. We're skipping from Exodus, the second book of the Bible, all the way to Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And as I read this to you, I want you to listen 
for connections and similarities between what I read for you here and what we know about Moses and the Red Sea and the Exodus and the people singing. There's a lot of stuff in the book of Revelation that can confuse us and distract us, and I'll be honest, there's a little bit of that here in what I'm going to read for you, but don't get distracted by those things. Pay attention to the things that connect with Moses, the Red Sea, passing through the Red Sea, the Exodus, and people singing. Let me read for you now from Revelation chapter 15. St. John writes, and I saw what appeared to be a sea. Alrighty, that should get us thinking about Moses and the Red Sea. I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass. And also those who had conquered the beast. Now the beast in the book of Revelation represents the worldly powers that are opposed to Jesus and his church. John says he saw a sea. And there was those who had conquered the beast standing beside the sea with harps of, harps of God in their hands. And they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. John says he sees a sea, and he sees people standing beside the sea, people who have conquered the beast, the worldly powers that are opposed to God, and these people are singing. That's the vision that John has here. That's the vision that he shares with us. And in this vision, the people that John sees there standing on the shores of the Red Sea are not the people of Israel from thousands and thousands of years ago. No. The people that John sees standing on the seashore, the people that John sees who have conquered the beast, are Christians. Christians just like you who live in the victory of Jesus' resurrection. Believe it or not, you're the one he's talking about when he says that he sees someone who has conquered the beast. You haven't conquered the beast by any strength or power or anything that you have in yourself, but you have conquered the beast. The powers of the world that are against Jesus and his church, you have conquered the beast by the blood of Jesus, which he shed for you, and by his resurrection, which means that you too shall rise. In the waters of your baptism, Jesus has brought you already through the Red Sea. And you stand, therefore, with Moses and with the people of Israel already, right now, on the far side, the safe side of the Red Sea. And that means that you and me and every other Christian in this world can join with Moses and the people of Israel in that song, the song of Moses. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He, the horse and his rider, he has thrown into the sea. Now that's an amazing thought, isn't it? To think that you are just like those people of Israel standing on the shores of the Red Sea. But that's not all. Because in what I just read for you, St. John doesn't just say that the people standing by the shores of the sea were singing the song of Moses. He says, yes, they were singing the song of Moses, but they're also singing the song of the Lamb. The song of of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, who is risen today. The song of the Lamb, Jesus, who invites us to his feast, where he feeds us with his own body and blood, the feast of the victory of our God. The song of the Lamb, Jesus, who was slain, but now risen from the dead, has begun his reign. The song of the Lamb, Jesus, who has brought us, his Israel, into joy from sadness. The song of Jesus, the Lamb, who has led you with unmoistened foot through the Red Sea waters. The song of the Lamb, Jesus, who has washed you in the tide flowing from his pierced side. 
the song of the Lamb, Jesus, your Redeemer, who grants you daily breath, the song of the Lamb, Jesus, who lives so that you might conquer death, the song of the Lamb, Jesus, who is risen so that we can say, Jesus is risen and we shall arise. We sing the song of Moses with the people of Israel long ago, but we also sing the song of the Lamb. But in reality, those two songs are the same song, the song of God's salvation for you. Before we wrap things up here this morning, I want to just take one moment now and turn our attention to another text of Scripture, in this case, our Old Testament reading for today from the prophet Isaiah. Because the story of Exodus, of course, doesn't end with Moses and the people of Israel standing and singing on the shores of the Red Sea. No. God leads them, eventually, to the Promised Land. It takes 40 years for them to get there, and there are three books of the Bible in between Exodus and the book of Joshua where it actually finally happens and they get into the Promised Land. And Moses himself isn't going to get to go into that Promised Land. He'll die before they get there. But God does, in fact, do it. He brings them, his people, to the Promised Land. And the prophet Isaiah, in our Old Testament reading today, shows us what our Promised Land is like. Our promised land, it's not some country or piece of land here on this earth like it was for the people of Israel. And it's not some place up with God in the sky either. Our promised land, the prophet Isaiah says, the land to which our Lord Jesus is leading us is a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth where heaven, the dwelling place of God, and earth, the dwelling place of people, are really one and the same. Where there is no difference between heaven where God is and earth where people are. Where the two are joined together. And in that new heaven and that new earth, Isaiah tells us, the former things, the ways of this sinful world, the pain and the sadness and the sorrow that we experience here and now will not be remembered anymore. There will be no one, Isaiah says, in that new heavens and that new earth who dies too soon and no one who doesn't live out his days because death itself will be no more. There will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The bad guys won't win because they will have been defeated forever. In that new heavens, and that new earth, there'll be work for us to do, Isaiah says. People will do things like build houses and plant vineyards. But everything in the midst of all of that will be just and good and right. No one will get ripped off or taken advantage of. No one will be oppressed or put out. Everyone will enjoy the fruits of his or her own labors, and God will be at hand right there to answer the prayers of his people before they can even get the words of those prayers out of their mouth. No one will be wishing upon stars because the desires and the needs of our hearts and of our minds will be met in an instant by the God who is present there among us. And in that new heaven and that new earth, creation itself will be at peace, restored to how it was before, the fall into sin. The wolf and the lamb, Isaiah says, two creatures that we think we got to probably keep those two far apart from each other because we don't want to see what's going to happen if they're close. He says they'll graze in the field together. And the lion, that beast that tears and devours, it'll eat straw like an ox, Isaiah says. That's our promised land a new heavens and a new earth. Kind of sounds like a Disney movie, doesn't it? But here's the good news. It's not. 
It's not a Disney movie. It's not the figment of some Disney writer's imagination. It is our hope. It is our very real hope. It is the land the Lord our God has promised to give to us. It is the fruit. It is the result. It is the byproduct of Jesus and his death and resurrection on our behalf. It is God's promised land for you. And if that's not enough to make you want to burst into song, then I don't know what is. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life that is everlasting. Amen.